You'll find throughout this lecture that there's a lot of stuff that seems really obvious, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of that through this, this whole course. And a big part of that is that so much of our group membership is kind of implicit. We, we recognize it when we look at it, right? We're like, yeah, that's, that's how things work. Uh, but the underlying thing that I really want all of you to pay attention to is the fact that it is implicit. It's something that we don't really pay attention to. We just kind of do it. Um, and so this allows you to, to really like take a step back and introspect a little bit and say, um, am I joining groups the way that I am just because that's kind of human nature? And is there a different way that I can maybe do this, right? So. Last week, or Monday, we talked a lot about the, the individual, right? Um, and now we're going to kind of transition into showing how those individuals come together. What kind of drives people to form groups in the first place? Um, and what are the kind of attracting principles that underlie all of this stuff? All right. So kind of overview, it's going to be kind of split into a couple of different chunks. So the first one is going to be uh, about why we join groups in the first place. So we're going to look at uh, a couple different levels of analysis, right? We're going to look at uh, different personality factors that'll kind of revolve around the big five. I'm sure you guys have heard of the big five before. Uh, and what personality traits are kind of more predictive of group membership. Uh, we'll look at some, some sex and gender differences with some caveats because a lot of these studies are old. Um, but then we'll also look at kind of what is motivating people to join groups in the first place? And what are some of the things that prevent people from joining those groups? Um, anxiety is, is huge, and I think it's kind of on the rise in, in our current culture and our current situation. I think the pandemic and the isolation around that probably produced a lot of social anxiety that people are trying to figure out how to kind of come back and reform into a connected society. Uh, and then we'll look at kind of what it is that's really kind of generating the attraction that we see in these groups. Um, it's often referred to as affiliation. Uh, and this, this concept here, social comparison, is going to be something that I'll probably bring up like through the whole course. It's a really fascinating uh, kind of brain process that we're constantly looking around and comparing ourselves to other people, right? That's how we kind of average out and figure out like what the rules are of the given situation that we're in. And then the last one is going to be kind of about uh, these underlying principles that keep people in groups. Cool. So. According to the research, there's kind of these three main factors that really kind of get people to want to join a group in the first place. So you have the, the individual stuff, the, the personalities, preferences, um, all of the, the kind of experience that you've been through as an individual, whether you've been in good groups or whether you've been in bad groups, all of that kind of adds up on the individual level. Um, but the really kind of important other side of this is that you can have a bunch of people that want to be in a group, but if the situation and the environment isn't suitable for you guys to be meeting and connecting, right? So let's say that you have a bunch of people that really want to be in a group, but you're meeting outside and it's 110 degrees and like, you're like, yeah, this is horrible and awful and I don't really feel like making friends right now. Uh, <laughs> the situation is really important. Um, but the last one, probably the most important is that um, even if you have a bunch of people that want to be in a group, there has to be something that allows these people to find commonality with one another, right? Find similarities between the people that really kind of create that attraction for them to want to be uh, in a relationship with that person in the first place. And that's, that's huge for maintaining the group as well and creating a, a level of cohesion, which we'll kind of get into in the, in the next lecture. So personality, the first one. So these are the little idiosyncrasies that we have, right? The little uh, ways that we approach different situations in different ways. And there've, there's been a ton of, of research trying to figure out, it's called individual differences research, trying to figure out why different people have different kind of motivations and proclivities and things like that. And a big one that kind of came out of this, there's other personality theories. This is probably the, the most adopted, at least in the, the, um, the academic world, 
is the Big Five Theory. And this actually originated here at the University of Oregon, for those of you that didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and it was, it was actually based on kind of a, a lexical research. So they, they looked at like all of the trait words in the entire dictionary and then figured out like which ones kind of lumped together. Um, and they found that like there was all of these trait words about being like outgoing and that was extroversion. And there's all of these trait words about being kind of liked and seen by other people and that's agreeableness. Uh, and then there's these other ones about kind of being organized and being timely and having like everything kind of set and in routine and habitual. That's kind of this idea of conscientiousness. Um, neuroticism would be the, the category that uh, encompasses anxiety type um, behaviors of whether or not you feel comfortable in a given situation or not. Um, and then openness to experience, as the name kind of implies, is being willing to try new things, to kind of break out of your mold, right? Um, and you have this, this little caveat down here, there's a lot of work being done uh, in this domain, especially this is one of the biggest personality research centers like in the world, uh, like Gerard Saussier, uh, Sanjay Srivastava are names that are known like all over the world for personality research. Um, and a lot of grad students wanna come here to do this kind of work. So extroversion is by far the most predictive of wanting to be in groups, right? When you think of uh, all of these traits are all on a continuum, right? So introversion is not a big five trait, it's part of extroversion. It's this continuum of where you're either really outgoing or you're not really outgoing, but you can also kind of fall in the middle. Um, people that are extroverted tend to feel charged up when they're with other people, like it fills their batteries. Whereas people that are introverted tend to kind of feel like being with other people and around other people is draining. It kind of drains their batteries. But extroverts are very oriented towards wanting to, to be in social experiences, very gregarious or like talkative and um, trying to make connections. And so the other side of that, as I was kind of getting at, is this idea of really being kind of oriented to your inner world. So you can think of extroversion as being really focused on external world and interacting with the external world and introversion being more about kind of understanding your, your own psychological position. And so, and this is that, that point that I was getting at is that group interactions are very stimulating for extroverts. And so um, if you have a, a really lively group and you go and you do personality tests of everybody in there, it's probably pretty likely that most of the people in that group are going to be extroverts. But there are a lot of exceptions. And like I said, this is a continuum. This is not a black and white kind of thing. You're either an extrovert or you're an introvert. These are tendencies, right? And that's how personality should be thought of is that it's not that I'm always this. It's that in certain situations, most of the time, I tend to be this way. They're kind of general descriptions of behavior. But it, it really ties into this idea of relationality. Um, all of these, these fancy academic words that just really mean <laughs> wanting to be friends with people. Uh, and so it's all about how one's kind of disposition, their values and attitudes and everything, facilitate their ability to really connect with, with other people. Right? And so people that are really high in this, um, this facet are people that really, really want to be part of a group. And it's when we talked about identity in the last lecture, this is a big part of their identity, that membership that they have or the relationships that they have. Those are things that they take a lot of pride in. Um, and you see a lot of this in team sports. Um, relationality is not just extroversion. It tends to be extroversion combined with agreeableness of that idea of um, kind of going with the flow, not being someone that's very confrontational, someone that is very agreeable. Outgoing and not picky. And these people that are really high in relationality tend to be the hubs of connection. Right? They tend to be the ones that really kind of bring the group together. 
they become friends with this person, then they bring a third person in. Uh, we talked about these like sociograms and we talked about networks. And so they tend to be these like central portions of the group that have a lot of connections to the group. But as you'll see, there's a difference between kind of wanting to be friends with a lot of people and then wanting to be kind of more intimate and have kind of stable, strong relationships with just a few people. And some people gravitate towards one or the other based on some of their needs. So I, uh, I'm about to present some, uh, some gender difference studies. And so this is just that caveat that a lot of the sex differences that we see in sociological research and group dynamic research in general is very tied to the structure of the society that you're studying, right? So if the, stu if the, the, if the society that you're studying has a structure that has very explicit roles for different genders, then those people are going to tend to fall into those roles because of the desirability of wanting to be a part of that society. And so it very much influences what you find in terms of is this really a thing about men and women or is this a thing about the, the structure of the society that you're studying? And so, and what we've seen as the research has continued into kind of adapting, especially right now. I mean, we're looking at generational divides that are so much bigger than we've ever seen before. I mean, uh, I have a little sister that's 10 years younger than me and she seems like she's from like 100 years in the future. Like, I, I don't relate to her because of things that are very different. Um, and so as these things change, as culture changes, we see that the role kind of structure changes and the way that they participate in groups tends to change. But traditionally, this was kind of the view that women tend to be a lot more extroverted than men. Um, but think about this in terms of extroverted being composed of a, a lot of different components. Um, that's what facets are, this word right here, facets. Uh, so the portions of extroversion that are connected with interpersonal warmth and gregariousness which tend to be um, predictors of intimacy, of wanting these strong, stable relationships, right? They tend to remember more details about the actual relationship, about the quality of the relationship, about things that have happened and things that haven't, and how that plays into whether they want that relationship to continue, right? And they tended to report that um, within the groups that they were a part of, it was more about the relationships. It was about being a part of something meaningful. Um, and so because of that, they tended to seek membership in these small kind of informal and intimate groups, ones that had stronger bonds. And this is kind of something that's gonna come up a lot through the class is the divide between relationship and task, right? So some groups are very task oriented. It's like, I'm in this group because this group is accomplishing something. Um, whereas other groups are more important for actually connecting people with one another. So as we move to men, a lot of the study tended to be about these kind of task oriented facets of group membership that really rely, uh, not rely, that really kind of gravitate towards power and influence. That um, I think this was a very strong um, driver of social structure as well though, is that this was kind of built into what it, what it meant to be a man, was that you were, you were supposed to try to accomplish things and be part of these big organizations and be the leader and be in charge. And you'll see a lot of this stuff is, is changing right now, but, um, there's this big difference that most of the men, when they kind of self-reported these things, talked about wanting to be in these really structured, really formal task-focused groups, right? It's not about the connections that I'm making in them, it's about the meaning and the, the work that I'm doing. And so all of this, like I said before, is all kind of on a continuum. And we'll, we'll look at that when we look at actual needs that we have, that we feel that we, we have, uh, whether or not we feel like we need group memberships so that we can have some sense of control in our lives, or we feel like we need group membership because we just need to be around people or because we need to be connected with people. They're very different drivers of wanting to, to be in one in the first place. And that kind of gets into this idea of, of motivation, right? What's really driving the person to be there in the first place, 
What are the, the habits and beliefs, all of these, these things that are really pushing them towards the types of experiences that they're seeking, right? And you can think of motivation as this energizing principle that really pushes someone in one direction or another. It's very dopamine driven. And so these are the three that I was just kind of getting at that we'll, we'll go into in more detail here in just a second. But there are diff very different reasons that people give for wanting to be a part of the groups that they're a part of. And there are very specific behaviors that arise based on what these actual motivations are that are underlying that behavior. And so starting with affiliation, Affiliation is just about being a part of the group, wanting high connections with lots of people. I just want to be around people, right? These people tend to be very extroverted type people, right? They join a lot of groups. They're constantly spending time with other people. Uh, the other side of that is that a lot of the time they're not spending a lot of time with themselves. Um, there's tons of communication, right? So it's all about trying to, to really kind of talk to and connect to and share experiences with as many people as, as you can. Um, and there's this, this really kind of strong urge to just accept people the way that they are. It's like, I just want to, to meet and experience as many types of group encounters as I can. Um, but what you see is that a lot of the times there's kind of this negative side to these strong needs for affiliation. I mean, we all have kind of these underlying needs for affiliation, but if that, if that need is, is really strong for a person, uh, there tends to be these kind of underlying kind of anxious motivations that are driving that. Um, and it's kind of this oxymoron when you really think about it, right? I'm talking about these people wanting to be around a lot of people, but then right here it's saying that, that they're anxious in social situations. But I think that anxiety is kind of driving that, that need, that there's this, this personal kind of suffering that's happening of, of being kind of afraid of true connection, true intimacy with other people. And so to kind of fill that void, just kind of trying to connect with as many people as you can. But there's this huge fear of rejection that's built into that, that a lot of the times this affiliation need can lead to really intense feelings of ostracization if, if something bad happens in one of these group situations. And you have this other side that's more about intimacy, right? So there's a lot of people that don't really care about being in these big group situations, being surrounded by people all the time and really just want those meaningful bonds with people. We call it love, right? I don't really know what love is other than this feeling of being connected with someone, being able to rely on someone and knowing that, they're, that they have your back, that they support you. They're close and they're warm, right? Something that give us comfort. And a lot of it is based around these ideas of support that these types of relationships are the ones that, that we lean on, right? When we are feeling bad, when we're feeling like we can't handle what's going on in the world, they're the ones that, they're the shoulder to cry on, right? But what you tend to see is that these people that have this high need for intimacy um, are usually able to find it for, um, because that's, that motivation is kind of driving the construction of these types of bonds. And a lot of that leads to Having a couple really strong bonds eliminates this fear of rejection. You have something to lean back on, right? So if I have these really strong bonds with a couple of close friends, then I don't really care what the guy at the concert said to me or whatever it may be. It's, it doesn't matter because I know that I have people that do care about me. And there's not this underlying kind of social anxiety driving the need to be a part of that group in the first place. So very much a focus on the friendship component, right? Um, and I think a big one here is this idea of reciprocity. That's, that's built into the important relationships that we have in our lives, is knowing that if I have your back, you have mine, right? And there's that expectation, there's that predictableness of that relationship that makes it such a good one. 
But then you have kind of this last one that seems a little divorced from the other two, um, and I think is very much a, um, a component of, I don't want to say like human society, because you very much see this in, uh, in the other apes and chimpanzees and bonobos and things like that. Uh, but it's this need for control. And a lot of the times what you see is that these needs for control usually arise from a lack of control in your own life. Right? Growing up in a family where you were the scapegoat or where you really didn't have a choice in a matter or not. It was like, you're going down this career path because I said so. Uh, and that lack of control leads to this really intense need to, to want to control. Um, there's the, the philosophical, uh, the people that should be in power, the people that want it least. I think that's where a lot of this comes from, right? But what you see is that these people that have a really high need for power and a high need for control don't really care about those individual strong relationships with one another. They actually avoid dyadic interactions. They don't want one-on-one -on -one time. They want to be in a structure which exists pretty readily in the capitalistic world of being in a hierarchy where they are in charge of a lot of people. And so that's where this idea of large group interactions comes, comes in. It's really hard. One of the, it didn't play out very well this time, but um, we did the, uh, the coding exercise for those of you that stayed after the, the methods lecture. Uh, and what came out of that was that when you're in really big groups, there tends to be a lot more influence kind of centered around a couple of people. So if you have eight or nine people, you tend to see that two or three of them dominate the conversation, dominate the influence, take control, take power. But when you have small groups, when you have four, five, two, three people, that influence tends to be really spread out. There's not really a, uh, an opportunity for someone to have more influence than another. And so that's why these people gravitate to these large groups, because it allows for that. And so, I mean, this is just kind of a definition of what control is, right? Kind of organizing and initiating. But uh, a big part of it's assuming responsibility. And there's not a problem with, like, having power or having control because there is a component of responsibility with it. But um, there definitely is a pathological side to this. These people very much enjoy being part of centralized structures where there is an inherent hierarchy that's built into the structure of the group that you're a part of. Whereas decentralized groups are ones where everybody kind of has their own independence and there's not really a central person that is coordinating or, or doing things. And there are very different advantages and disadvantages to, to both of those structures, but um, there's a lot more centralized ones in, in our world because of the types of tasks that our society works towards. Yeah, and this was something I kind of got at at the in the slide about men in general is that uh, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. We don't know if this is because of the, the structure around patriarchal societies that kind of drove this need in the first place, but um, very much in the research it comes out as being much more of a male trait. So there's a lot of people that have a hard time being in social situations. It's very, very common. They call this social inhibition, right? Um, and this is, this is really interesting that it, it kind of is something you can notice as early as, as the age of two. My son is definitely not socially inhibited. <laughs> God, we went on vacation and put him at one of the daycare centers and we were like expecting this like, no, mom and dad. And he was just like, bye. <laughs> it was kind of sad. Like, <laughs> miss me, no. I, but you'll see that uh, a big strategy that's used because a lot of the times our society is one in which you can't really avoid group membership. It's, it's part of what it means to be in a society. And so people with social inhibition have to find ways around kind of those anxieties of being around people in general. And so one of the ways they do that is through this idea of surrogacy. Um, I'm sure that like you didn't know what the, the title was, but I'm sure all of you have been in situations where you've either been that person or you've had someone be that role for you. It's someone that usually has ties to the group already that can kind of take the place of, 
initial interactions, uh, kind of introducing you, it takes a lot of the pressure off of you having to break the wall down, right? You have this person that can really kind of break the ice, bring the tensions down, and allow you to get past the social anxiety and to really kind of open up and express who you really are. So the whole idea about it is, like for a, an exam question, is that it's all about transitioning into the group, that there's this, this helper that can kind of get you there. And all of this is based around social anxiety, which, uh, like I said, I think is very much on the rise in our society. Um, it's, it's really interesting that we're one of the most connected and yet disconnected societies that's ever existed, right? We have the ability to get on our phones and connect with hundreds of people that we've met over decades that we've been alive or whatever, but the actual rates of, like, human-to-human, -human, face face-to-face interaction have drastically declined compared to what they were even 50 years ago, where people spent most of their time around other people and working with other people. I mean, think about the jobs that we do now these days, too. So much of it is impersonal. Sit at computers, we fill out fact sheets or whatever. Like, there's a lot of interaction still in the service industry, but it's still towards a, a task. It's not about kind of forming relationships in general. Um, but a lot of this kind of comes as you, as you grow up. Um, there's so much of social anxiety that's built on rejection in the past. That if you feel like you haven't been a part of something, that you haven't been accepted, that it kind of builds up over time and it turns into this, I don't know if I should even try to put myself out there because people might not like me. Right? And it's, it's usually this like, I want to make a good impression, I want, to, I want people to like me, uh, but then there's also this, this level of like putting so much into that that it ends up inhibiting your ability to even make a good impression, right? And a lot of the times it just causes people to withdraw instead of taking action to, to actually go out and see if they're wrong about those anxieties, it uh, is, feels a lot safer to, to just not try. And this is a, is a big thing, too. And it's, I know there's probably a lot of people in here that fall on both sides of the spectrum, right? And there's something that, that we can do with this information, right? Uh, if you're someone that is socially anxious, then there's this, this portion of identifying it and accepting it, right? Like, really, like, looking at it and saying, like, okay, this is something that other people have. I'm not alone in this. Um, but on the other side, the people that are not socially anxious, if you can notice these signs, if you can notice these cues, right, the silence and the downcast eyes and the low speaking voice, whatever it is, those are bids for some type of connection, right? And that's something that you can lean into instead of seeing it as this like social stigma, right? Like that these people are just not friendly or they're not group people because most of the times they want to be. And there's something that we can do to accept them into the groups that we're a part of. That's my soapbox for the day. So, uh, so attachment style is something that I think, I mean, this could have an entire course. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is something I'm very wrapped into uh, as a parent because uh, attachment style is something that is generated as a child. And it's something that's very much generated as the bond between a parent and a child. There's so much, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad to see there's a, a, a big kind of swing away from this generational, uh, I don't want to say generational trauma, but generational patterns of what the capitalistic society kind of turned parenthood into in the last hundred years. Of Here's a bunch of like, uh, electronic babysitters and convenient things for parents that really kind of decreased the actual attachment that, that parents had with their kids. Because showing your kid that you're there for them, showing them that, that they are important and they are connected to you produces lifelong behaviors. So the secure attachment style is one in which they feel incredibly confident in the relationship that they have with their parents. That when their parents leave, they know that their parents are coming back. They know that their parents love them. They know that their parents are always there for them when they're hurt, when they're emotional, whatever it may be. And it produces a level of confidence later in life. 
of being really like okay with the relationships in your life, not being anxious about the relationships in your life. The next step down is kind of this preoccupation, right? As a kid, you're, you're trying to connect and your parents just sitting there on their phone playing some bejeweled game or whatever and like not actually engaging. And it, 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 turns into, it turns into rejection in a way. And it turns into fears about if I really put myself out there, if I really try to connect, it doesn't work, right? This is the seat of social anxiety kind of on the surface. Uh, the last one is very much fearful, right? So this is one in which there's trauma, there's abuse, there's uh, actual rejection on, a, in, on an intense level of telling these children that they aren't good enough, telling them that they can't be what they want to be, that you're not there for them. Um, that produces lifelong insecurity about relationships in general and inhibits your ability to, to really take part and enjoy group membership. Uh, and the last one kind of falls in the same group, uh, but here it's, it kind of takes a different turn where instead of being fearful of groups, you're just like, I don't need them. Like they were never anything good for me. They never did anything for me. I don't need these kind of relationships in my life. And a lot of the times, this is what leads to a high need for control. A lot of this stuff is hard to study too. Like imagine yourself as a PhD student saying, I'm gonna pick this cohort of three-year-olds that are on their iPad all the time, and I'm not gonna publish something for 10 years because I have to wait for them to become teenagers and actually show all of these symptoms, right? Uh, this stuff is hard to study. But it's really amazing that there are people that have like stuck through with these really long studies. So this very much kind of ties into the attachment style stuff, but kind of on a, think of it more on an adult level and your interactions with the groups that you're a part of, right? Uh, people that have good experience in groups tend to seek more group membership and people that have really bad uh, experiences with groups tend to avoid them, right? Uh, people that don't have very much experience at all have these levels of uh, ambivalence and uncertainty, right? Like, I don't really know what to expect. I don't know how to conduct myself. Uh, but then you have these, these veterans that have had really positive experience in the past. These tend to be the ones that are really high in relationality, tend to be kind of these connectors with other people. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that's growing uh, about kind of brain circuits in general that uh, when you experience failure in group membership and strategies that you're using to connect with other people, that it changes the way that your brain approaches that in the future. Yep. So these motivations can kind of be broken down into these, these two components when you're really thinking, and this is kind of that introspective uh, kind of summary right here, right? Uh, really thinking about why it is that you're motivated to be in any of the relationships that you're a part of in your life. Um, on the internal side, what are the things about you that play out in a group dynamic setting, right? Are you open to experiences? Are you anxious? Are you extroverted and gregarious? Or are you more introverted and shy? But then on the other side too, what is the external motivation that's driving you to that specific group in the first place, right? Is it because that group has some type of information that you need, right? That's why you're all sitting here right now, right? Is it because that group provides some, tor some type of support, right? So there are a lot of people that go to AA meetings, not because they want to make friends, but because they want someone to lean on. And then the last one would be about companionship. You can find this in friendships. You can find it in team sports. Uh, you can even find it in, in work if you have a job that is actually a good one, <laughs> which not many that exist these days, but I think there are some very clever people that are changing that. So this is something I hinted at at the very beginning of the lecture that's, that's really interesting from kind of a, a neurological level. Uh, and 
to, to really think about, like, this is something we do so, so much, right? Uh, when you come into a room, like let's say coming into a classroom, right? If everyone in that classroom already is silent, staring forward, is just like adopting a certain posture, you will do the same thing. You will sit there, you will adopt a certain posture, whatever. You come into a classroom where everybody's talking and everybody's like kind of free spirited or whatever and there's desks turned to the side or whatever, you'll adopt that position because of the social comparison that you're engaging in. It allows us to really gauge what's appropriate in any given situation and this is how social norms are, are formed really. This produces kind of an average behavior in a group, right? that we are constantly looking at other people. And this is, like I said, I said this is very neurological. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are neurons that fire when I'm doing something, but also when I'm watching you do something. And it's extremely important for the way that we learn as humans, the way that our brain works, is that we're constantly trying to gather information from the people around us to figure out what it is that we're supposed to do. I mean, this is what rearing a child is. The child is constantly trying to model themselves after you. Um, and it usually happens when you're confused, right? You're, you walk into a situation, you're like, uh, what am I supposed to do here? How am I supposed to act? And it kind of gives you this, this clarity of, okay, I'm doing the right thing, right? And so these are some kind of different uh, different ways that you can engage in social comparison, right? Uh, to evaluate your own qualities. Think about this on a value base, right? Like, do the people around me care about the same things that I do? And if they don't, is there something wrong with the way that I care about the world? Um, are people setting high personal goals around me? Are people achieving things more than I am? Or are people achieving things less than I am? And maybe I need to like stop working so hard, right? Uh, looking around to see if people need help. That's kind of a, a sad one because there's tons of research that we just like walk by people that need help. But um, this is kind of the pathological one down here at the, at the bottom. Um, and this is kind of built into human society is that there's uh, very much a drive to want to feel superior to other people that you may view as outgroup members, right? Um, I'm in the process of building a, a course on addiction, and this is a huge thing with uh, dealing with addicts in general. When you look at it from a therapeutic, a therapeutic, therapeutic approach, um, there's a lot of judgment about what it means to have made those choices, to have like gone down that road and hit rock bottom. Um, and there's this kind of social comparison that I'm better than that person, right? I'm not that. It's a uh, version of upward social comparison. So these are kind of the, the two different ways that we engage in this kind of brain process. Uh, and they're, the reason I keep referring to them as brain processes is because it's something that our brain naturally does to make us feel good about ourselves, right? So when we don't know things, when we feel like we're kind of low end on the totem pole, then we tend to compare upward. We tend to see like, okay, those people have more information than I do, so maybe I should kind of lean on them um, so that I can be more similar to them, so I can be more well-informed. Uh, but this can also, social, upward social comparison can often lead to this, this feeling of not being good enough, right? You're looking around at all these people that have more information, that are doing better than you, um, and it makes you feel like you're not doing good enough. So join a different group where people are doing worse than you, right? No, that's not the advice, but uh, that's what a lot of people do, right? So when your self-esteem is on the line, usually in terms of upward social comparison, then we try to balance that out by engaging in this downward social comparison. Well, there's people that are worse off than me. There are people that have less information and less uh, good qualities than I do, right? And our brain naturally looks for people to, like, to achieve this. It reduces cognitive dissonance and it raises this idea that we are good people. We are the, the positive person that we want to be. I'm, I'm projecting this as like, uh, 
polar ends of this spectrum. But this is a very big continuum, right? Um, it's not always the case that downward social comparison is me comparing myself to a drunk, right? Um, the very much could just be that, like, I, let's say that you're in high school band and the person next to you is a little bit worse at that little rudiment than you are. It, like, it's like, ooh, yeah, I did more practice than you, right? It, yeah, right? Yeah. And then you have this, like, uh, <laughs> the person that's seat number one looks at all of them and is like, I'm better than all of you, right? Um, but all of this is, is all gauged toward trying to find equilibrium, trying to figure out where you fit in kind of the hierarchy that you're a part of. And this is not something I'm going to test on. This is just kind of a, an interesting... Um, theoretical model that was created to uh, try to understand why it is we do the things that we do because of social comparison. And so uh, it's this really interesting phenomenon that you see that people are really kind of willing to celebrate other people's accomplishments when it's not something that's important to them, right? So taking this like band example, right? If if playing piano is really, really important to me, it's hard for me to celebrate that other guy being better than me at piano. But if I hear this guy play this awesome thing on the saxophone, it's like, oh yeah, awesome job, right? Uh, it's not something we really think about, right? It's something that's like innate, something that our brain just automatically is like, oh, I'm not as good, I'm not performing as well as I should be, right? And so you see that it drives group membership type stuff where these people tend to join groups where people are worse at the things that are important to them, right? They, join, they don't join a group of really good piano players. They join a group of saxophone players, right? And yeah, and that's kind of, and perform very well on tasks that are not central to one's self-worth. So this is an interesting theoretical model. Uh, there are a lot of situations where this plays out, but as we'll see, there are a lot of other components to, to why we end up in the friendships that we end up in and the, the groups that we end up in. And so one of the other things that was kind of mentioned was this idea of social support, right? We'll get a lot into this uh, in some of our, our last, I think it's our very last lecture when we talk about uh, therapeutic stuff. We talk about group therapy. Uh, we talk about support system systems in general, excuse me. Um, but that social support is something that we very much like yearn for. And a lot of the times it's something that we very much lean on in times of stress. This was really hard for me when, I mean, when we had our kid, we're just like on this island out here in Oregon, have a kid in March of 2020 with <laughs> no family or friends around, like, it was, it was hard, and this was something that I think produced a lot of anxiety in me of not having that support to lean on. Um, and it drove, it, drove, it drove a lot of my behaviors towards wanting to engage in groups once things kind of opened back up. But it very much is something that when we have those strong bonds, I came across this really interesting study the other day that said that people that are in loving relationships experience less pain. So if you have two people that have the exact same, that have the exact same illness, that are at the same stage of that illness, the people that report being in strong, stable relationships report being in less pain. And that it could be something about that support that allows you to maybe forget about that for a second and really like enjoy the time that you have with those people. And the people that are in bad relationships, it's like, I want to run away from this relationship, so I'm going to consume myself with my own illness and my own pain. Getting us to loneliness. Uh, so very much a facet of, of life that I'm sure everyone has experienced, um, but very much something that doesn't have to be about being alone, right? Uh, this is something that can very much be just not feeling like you're really accepted by the people that you're around. I brought up the Robin Williams quote a couple uh, lectures ago, but it fits really well here too. It's that the worst thing in life is to be surrounded by people and to feel alone. Um, and so there's two kind of facets to this. There's uh, emotional loneliness. And so this is 
uh, very much I think the, the whole like being around people and still feeling lonely is that even though you're around people, think about that high need for affiliation, right? You're constantly connecting with tons of people, but none of them are meaningful, right? It's like if, if something happened to me, would these people care? Would these people be there for me? But then social loneliness, on the other hand, is actually being cut off, being ostracized, right? And we saw all of the just terrible consequences that can happen from the isolation that that produces. I mean, this is just kind of on the psychological domain, but these, these feelings of sadness and depression and emptiness. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to bring up this other class because it's like on my mind a lot right now, but this is very much a source of addiction. Uh, I think right now 30% of the population uh, would qualify for substance use disorder. And when you, when you interview these people, a lot of the times there are holes that are trying to be filled, right? It's this pain that we feel from not being accepted that we try to hide with other things. And so we look for ways to alleviate that. And something I've mentioned in some of the classes that's really cool about the society that we're a part of, if you're willing to kind of take that leap and look for it, is that there are so many ways to join groups these days that don't just involve the people that you're around, right? There's so many creative ways to connect and you can alleviate that stuff. Even if you've had bad experiences in your life, like there are people out there like you. <laughs> that can give you that kind of support. They help organize these connections, right? The group membership itself, if it's the type of group that values relationships, can really promote that development. Um, this is a huge driver of why I do the group activities after class. Like, I don't think that it should be for a grade because I think that it should just be an opportunity for us to drop the walls a little bit and connect with other people as human beings. And this is why, right? There is a lot of research about people and group membership being healthier when you feel like you're a part of something, when you feel like you belong to something. And this is really, really pronounced, we'll see in our cohesion lectures, very, very pronounced in cohesive groups where you have strong, intimate bonds within that group. Cool, so this will be the, the last kind of section of the lecture. And this gets into what is really driving the connections that we make. Uh, not from an internal motivation perspective, but kind of from a bird's eye view. Like why are these people connecting with these people? Um, and what is it about this attraction that allows people to to find other people that are like them. And so we'll, this is kind of just like a, an overview slide because we're going to get into each of these individually, but these are kind of the, the main drivers of attraction. Uh, this one being kind of the most prevalent, the first one, uh, proximity. We tend to just become friends with people that are there. Um, but we also very much try to find people that are similar to us. Uh, some of my work is trying to figure out whether or not our brains are firing the same way because we're similar or if there's some type of process where we become similar as we get to know each other more. Um, but then the, the last one is a really big one, is that we don't really find attraction with people that are not positive to us. And this gets really kind of sad in situations where you're, you're in a group that you can't really leave um, but doesn't have a lot of positive interaction. Right? If it's a family situation or a spouse situation or whatever it may be, um, that's, those are the situations that are really tough because the attraction disappears, but the, the bond kind of has to stay. So the proximity principle is the first one. Uh, this is just really for exam purposes. Proximity, close up, right? I don't know why I'm holding this clicker that doesn't work. Um, still? <laughs> yeah, still. Yeah, I, I am in a fog these days. All right. so. Uh, so this is very much, like I said, it's about just being close to one another. I'm sure a lot of you can kind of relate to the idea of being really good friends with someone that lived down the street from you, right? 
of getting together in the neighborhood and like um, a lot of the times it could have been too that like uh, I know in in my personal life uh, I was a member of a church growing up and like my mom's friends had kids and so I hung out with those kids it was it was all about just who was there and so this is something that uh, they've actually done these studies in dorms in college dorms they go through and they see who becomes friends with who over the to like however many terms these people live in dorms all of the friend groups are next door neighbors <laughs> yeah. there's some that are like across the hall or whatever but most of it is like same level door to door um, but this is kind of the caveat to that right there it can't just be proximity like there has to be some type of extra attractive possibility there because uh, if that person is just nothing like you, has completely different values than you, then being close to them is probably a bad thing. We just got new neighbors, and that is very much the case. <laughs> just like, we thought the last neighbors were bad, and then we were like, oh, yeah. Just like pulled into the driveway with this huge, just like, picture in the back of the truck window of like a half-naked lady. Like, yes, this is a great neighborhood for that. <laughs> Uh, so this is something that uh, doesn't necessarily get at uh, the attraction per se, uh, but just kind of describes the fact that groups tend to become more complex over time. And so you may start as this kind of proximal group of getting together with people like you, but over time you tend to bring more people into the fold. And the group tends to get bigger, tends to get more uh, specialized and things like that, it, it tends to expand. I mean, that's the whole idea here in terms of like the exam is that the elaboration principle is about the idea that groups get bigger over time. And it's usually related to that relationality idea. Uh, these network analyses um, are really good at showing that, that uh, yeah, over time, it's, it's something, uh, there's like studies that Dunbar, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dunbar, talks about how we as humans and it's that, uh, that equation we did on like the first day of class. It's really hard for us to maintain lots of connections. And so when the group gets bigger, you tend to see these like subgroups form and these schisms form. And it's really informative for a company when they come in and do these network analyses to see where those divides are so that they can organize around it, right? And because a lot of the times, these different subgroups have different values and different motivations. And if you can understand that, then you can kind of cater to that if you care. But that's the big point. Uh, so this is huge. This one is very much driving so much of our group membership is that we're attracted to people who have similar values, that have similar, similar beliefs, that maybe grew up in the same country, went to the, the same schools, went to the same, have the same kind of religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs that we have. Um, it's really hard to connect with people that are very different than us, right? And a lot of this, um, and this is really big in my work, is trying to understand kind of why this is the case. And a lot of it revolves around predictability is that like what the brain is doing is trying to predict what's gonna happen in the future um, and trying to put itself in a position where there's not uncertainty. And so if people are like you, it's really easy to predict what they're probably gonna do. Um, and there's actually some really interesting brain research that looks at how uh, when there's a region of the brain that lights up really, really reliably when you think about yourself. And there's this other region that lights up when you're thinking about other people. If that other person is really similar to you, the activity starts falling into the self land. So you're like using yourself to understand these other people, to predict what these other people are going to do. And so uh, this is kind of the idea for the exam is that it's very much based on uh, values and beliefs are huge, but uh, attitudes in general, if, if they are very confrontational and you're not very confrontational, and that's, that's a big one. But um, this is, I, I'd say that most of them are kind of in this top category, uh, but then a huge driver is also demographics. Um, you don't very often find groups of people that are a couple of 20 year olds and a 58 year old. You know, they exist but they're not very common. Um, and the same with race, ethnicity, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you tend to find more groups that split on gender. And so similarity is big. 
And this is, this is kind of the interesting thing. So um, if the group ends up having to get smaller or whatever, the person that's the least similar is usually the one that gets the boot. And that, that comment really ties into this next idea, which is the, the complementary principle. So when you really think about it, I just proposed this idea that we tend to be with people that are similar to us. I'm sure a lot of you, though, can think about people in your lives that are not really similar to you, but that you're still kind of, you have these strong bonds with, that somehow their skills and values or whatever complement your own in, uh, in pretty unique ways. But what you tend to find, oh, and this is kind of just some examples of that, right? Dominant behaviors uh, produce submissive behaviors and others. Leaders seek out followers, strong seek the weak. Uh, those are kind of just these overarching ideas. Uh, you can think about this in terms of lots of different stuff, uh, in terms of different skill sets and different attitudes and different beliefs that really kind of complement uh, what it is that you're trying to do. Um, there is, when we get into leadership, you will see that there is a desire for people to seek out leaders uh, of like not really wanting to make all of the decisions, especially in situations where like you don't really care about the overall goals of the group or whatever it is. Um, but this is kind of the really interesting caveat to this, is that similarity is usually the main driver, and this is what brings small groups together. But as the groups elaborate, as they start to get bigger, then they start to bring in complementary type people. But uh, a really important part here is that this person that you bring in that has these complementary attributes, whatever they may be, uh, they still have to match the level of kind of attitude and tone in the group. Friendliness and warmth, how positive or, how ne or even how negative it's a group that just loves talking about how much they hate everything. It's going to be a really bad idea to bring someone in that's just like, but the world's a great place, right? There's, there's always kind of this underlying level of similarity in these groups that we're part of. Uh, and this is not necessarily something that drives attraction per se, but it's something that can definitely destroy attraction, right? We, this is very much tied to the ideas I was just talking about in terms of predictability. We really want people to do things that are predictable. And that means that, and there's this, a very strong social norm in our, in our culture that when I do something, you do something in return. And when that doesn't happen, it can very much kind of destroy the attractive principles. And so this is, this is what I was saying in terms of predictability, right? If, if someone kind of expresses this, this liking for us, right? Uh, it's kind of this idea that they expect that I'm going to treat them with respect, compassion, benevolence, whatever it is. Um, but I'm also expecting the same thing from them. Um, I lived in the Middle East for a year and like the greeting that you do whenever you come into contact with someone is assalamu alaikum and wa alaikum salam and it's peace be upon you and peace be upon you as well. And it's this reciprocity. It's like, I'm here in good faith and so are you and like, that's kind of the whole idea behind this. But it also has uh, a negative side as well, right? And this is something to be really acutely aware of. Um, when someone does something negative to you, think about whether or not you're doing something negative back just because of reciprocity, right? I'm sure that a lot of people can relate to that. Uh, very into like stoicism there's a lot of really good practices that talk about like when someone does something bad to you and you're really angry and you write this whole text that you're about to send to hurt them to put it down go back to it in an hour and read it say like okay was that just because of the reciprocity or is this stuff that actually needs to be like hammered out and talked about right and a lot of the times it's usually just hurtful stuff that doesn't need to be said at all. So this is where we'll kind of, I think this might be the last one, I can't remember, but um, kind of wrap up in terms of 
one underlying principle that has been very much left out for anyone that kind of caught it. It's like we're talking about all of these group membership things as being these like feel good, like we want to connect with people, we want to be with people, but there is a huge part of group membership that is purely centered around economics. We join groups that have a benefit for us and we avoid groups that have some type of cost to us, right? The reason that you are all in this room right now is because it's going to put something on your transcript and on your resume that will potentially help you get a job in the future. And there's probably a lot of people that if that wasn't the reward, the time spent in this classroom would not be worth it, <laughs> right? So the whole idea behind this is that we are very much trying to maximize as much as we can out of the groups that we're a part of, whether that's in terms of the relationships that we get and the warmth that we get from that, whether it's in actual uh, advancement in society and task achievement. Um, and what we're trying to minimize is a loss of time and a loss of money, right? I don't wanna waste a bunch of money on something that doesn't produce anything tangible for me, that doesn't give me relationship or meaning, meaning in life uh, but I will spend lots of time and lots of money engaging in certain activities that allow me to meet people, that allow me to do these things. And I'll tell you what, capitalism has taken advantage of that, <laughs> right? So very, very economic way of looking at it, but um, you got to keep in mind that that's a, a big part of how we approach life in general. Is that yeah? It's great to have good members, good like friendships and things like that. But if those friendships are at the cost of you not performing well in school, or you wasting money and not having enough money to pay your rent or whatever, those group memberships are probably going to be less important to you. Cool. All right. So that is the end of the lecture. Uh, so I will stop recording and then uh, for whoever wants to say we'll get in groups and uh, you guys can kind of chat about the, the case study. <laughs>